Uh, hi everyone, thanks for your interest in my APS talk, uh, despite the circumstances. Um, regardless, I'd like to thank the APS Quantum Quantum Division for inviting me. Um, so I am I'm Ted Yoder uh, from IBM, and this is joint work with Rahul, who is a, a PhD student at Stanford, um, and who, who is also our intern. Um, so I think in the in the scientific program this was called something like uh, surface codes based on rotation systems acting on Majorana fermions and and that is like a technique that we use but I, I wanted to give here a more general title um, so a, a graph based formalism for surface codes and twists um, because our motivation is really just one of, of unifying a bunch of surface code models and then going beyond that with some some more examples and uh, new codes Okay so, okay, so here we have a bunch of different surface code models that are in the literature. In the lower left, we have the bravi kataev model, which is the first surface code on the plane. Um, and then Bombin and Martin Delgado recognized that you could rotate this um, to reduce the number of physical qubits that you need. Um, so you, get a, you still get one logical qubit and a code with the same distance, but you've um, cut the number, number of physical qubits in half, roughly. Um, and then uh, Bombin sometime later noticed that you could encode logical information into what are called twist defects um, in, in, his, in this 2010 paper, Icing Anions with a Twist. Um, but then also in the literature are a bunch of uh, different representations of twists. So in, in my work with Isaac Kim, we had this triangular surface code where we've moved one of these like Hector Bombin twists into the middle of the code. Um, and also get a savings in the number of qubits here, right? Over the over the standard rotating surface, uh, rotated surface code. Um, and then Kesselring et al. sort of generalized uh, the triangle code even into some sort of stellated codes, um, which so asymptotically, as you increase the the symmetry, um, can uh, use even fewer qubits per logical qubit. And then there are different varieties of twists, like like Krishna and Pulan also have some sort of uh, different construction of these of these defects. Um, so what we're really asking here is, you know, so what unifies these models? Can we come up with a formalism um, uh, where each of these are special cases, and then once we have such a formalism, uh, what new codes can we find out? Okay, so so why do you want to unify these? Um, well, uh, the first, the zeroth reason might just be sort of uh, being intellectually satisfied, right? That you uh, that you now understand <laughs> the full scope of what's out there. Um, but some more concrete reasons are like um, if if I want to optimize the code parameters, um, n being the number of physical qubits, k being the number of logical qubits, and d being the code distance. Um, it's nice to have a general framework to sort of search through. Um, and so, so this bound where n is, is at least kd squared, or some constant times kd squared, uh, the bravi pool and Terhal bound, um, we want to optimize the constant c, uh, or, or minimize it more specifically. Um, the, the second reason might be that you want to uh, you know, figure out what, what properties are fundamental to the surface code. Like, is it important that that sort of the x logical operator is one, running one way and the z the other? Um, certainly, the topology of the logical operators is important. The fact that you, the fact that these are string-like. Um, so we'll see some of that in our in our more generalized model. And then third, uh, you might want to relate different uh, different codes through some like local uh, Clifford transformations. Um, so some sort of like generalization of Pockner moves. Um, so, I, so I have like one slide on this as well. Um, so we'll, we'll go through each of these um, most explicitly number one is what we'll care about. Okay, so here's um, something of an outline of our construction. So um, you start with an embedded graph in, in any two manifold. It can be orientable or not. Um, and then um, you associate Majoranas to every half edge and odd degree vertex. We'll motivate why that's the case. And in doing so, you get a Majorana surface code. And then from this Majorana surface code, 
um, you can associate some qubits um, such that the Hilbert spaces are, are equivalently represented. Um, and you associate these qubits to the vertices of the graph. Um, and now you end up with a qubit surface code. Um, so if you wanted to skip the Majorana part, we also have a way to do that. If you define these, uh, what we call cyclically anti-commuting uh, sets of polys. Okay, so that's the rough outline of the construction and we'll go through in more detail, obviously. Um, but then once you have the construction, um, you can prove things about what the, the code parameters are after, after you do this. So we have a formula for K we have bounds on the code distance, um, and then we have examples of different uh, kinds of surface codes and Pochner moves to to move between um, different codes or, or move around some of the, the odd degree vertices. Okay, um, so to begin, we have to describe what a graph embedding is. Um, and there's a nice combinatorial description of a graph embedding uh, from the math community, uh, which is called a rotation system. So what a rotation system is, is um, a set, you start with a set of half edges and um, also two permutations of this set. Um, so nu uh, is just any old permutation and epsilon is a permutation that has to square to identity and also has no fixed points. And so now the, the things we associate with graphs, the vertices, edges, and faces, um, are, correspond to orbits of nu, epsilon, and nu composed with epsilon, respectively. Um, so for instance, this is why epsilon needs to square to identity, because uh, epsilon maps you from one half edge to the other half edge um, that, that both combined make up one edge of your graph. Um, so you can see on the right here some examples of how a face it corresponds to an orbit of nu composed with epsilon, how a vertex corresponds to an orbit of nu, how an edge corresponds to an orbit of epsilon. Um, and then you can just figure out the genus of this the surface using Euler's formula and counting the number of orbits. Um, so the, the first part of this slide is a, is a brief outline of what Majoranas are and Majorana codes. Um, Majorana operators are just like these mutually anti-commuting operators we'll think of here and then um, uh, they have a they define a Majorana group and if I'm defining a uh, Majorana stabilizer code, um, then we can just take some subgroup of that Majorana group uh, to form our stabilizers. And it's important that, of course, minus i is not in the in the stabilizer, and also that every stabilizer has even weight. Um, that's sort of a physical uh, constraint that the stabilizers preserve for me on parity. Okay, and so so starting from our our graph embedding, our rotation system. We associate Majoranas to each half edge and also each odd degree vertex. Um, so this is kind of like what uh, Bravi et al. do in uh, this correcting coherent errors with service codes paper, um, but they just they just do it for the the rotated service code, um, and this is the more general prescription. Now, uh, I've just told you where to put the Majoranas. Um, but you also have to define stabilizers for them. Um, so the stabilizers are associated to each vertex and also each face. Um, so this picture on the right is supposed to be representing uh, that the vertex stabilizers are the products of all Majoranas on half edges around that vertex and also possibly a Majorana at that vertex if it's an odd degree vertex. And a face, uh, a face stabilizer is the product of all Majoranas uh, around uh, around that face on the half edges only, um, so it's so it's outlined in gold on the on the right. And so what sort of struck me about this rotation system picture is that we are we have these you know sort of abstract half edge objects that we use to define the graph, but now we're instantiating them with 
uh, with something physical, these, these Majorana operators. Okay, so from the Majorana code, uh, we want, now want to convert it to, the, to a qubit surface code. Okay, so uh, what we need to recognize is that there's this simple Majorana code where you have m Majoranas, and the only stabilizer, or the only non-identity stabilizer, is just the product of all uh, the Majoranas. And this, this happens to encode um, m-2 over 2 qubits. And uh, a basis for the logical operator is just like any uh, product of two Majoranas. Um, but this simple service code we can recognize is located at any face, uh, or at any, sorry, any vertex um, of our, our code construction. So if we just, you know, replace the the code space of, of this simple vertex code uh, with m minus 2 over 2 qubits, um, then we, we've we represented the exact same Hilbert space. So we, we just want to place m minus 2 over 2 qubits at every vertex. Um, so this, this corresponds to um, placing 1 qubit at degree 3 and 4 vertices, 2 qubits at degree 5 and 6 vertices, and etc. Three qubits at seven and eight, etc. And now the only stabilizers we have are just associated to faces of the graph. Um, the vert vertex stabilizers in the Majorana code are automatically taken care of. Um, okay, so to describe this somewhat more directly without referring to the Majoranas, um, we can we can define a cyclically anti-commuting list of polys, and this is just some, some ordered list of polys where neighbors in the list, and it's also cyclic of course, so the, the first element is a neighbor of the last element, um, neighbors in the list anti-commute, and anything else commutes. Okay, so, so like simple examples of cyclically anti-commuting lists are ju it, just the list xyz or the list xz xz. Okay, so Given your embedded graph, um, you write down a cyclically anti-commuting list of polys around each vertex, and of course the, the like length of that list will have to correspond to, to the degree of that vertex. And then the product of polys within a face um, is what you want to define as your stabilizers. Um, so you get one stabilizer for every face. Um, and you can also compare this with uh, what Jonas Anderson calls the label set in, in this paper, um, which uh, is basically his version of cyclically anti-commuting lists for um, vertices that are that have one qubit at them. So in our language, as would be the degree in four, three and four vertices. Okay, so how do you construct cyclically anti-commuting lists? Um, well, uh, as I said, it's, it's obvious for degree 3 and 4, or length 3 and 4, um, uh, where you just have x, y, z, and x, z, uh, x, z. But then actually for higher degrees or longer lists, um, you can just compose these degree 3 and 4 lists. Um, so on the, on the left here, we have a degree 7 vertex, which means that we have to write 7 polys around it. But then if we decompose it into 2 degree 4, vertices and one degree three vertex, um, we can actually just read off the polys that we should choose. Um, so in this case, uh, you know, there, there are seven sectors on the, in the right-hand drawing, and there are seven sectors on the left-hand drawing, and those just correspond to each other one-to-one. Uh, -one. And likewise with uh, a degree eight vertex. I mean, now, we, now it's just the composition of three degree four vertices. And um, you can imagine doing this like if I have uh, for even larger L, if I have L equals nine, um, then I would just tack on another degree three vertex. Okay, so I've told you how to how to build your surface codes using these cyclically anti-commuting lists and some embedded graph. And now the question is, you know, what are the properties of those codes? How many qubits does it encode? What is the code distance? Um, so uh, we'll take care of the number of encoded qubits here. Uh, this theorem tells us k, tells us the number of encoded qubits, 
um, based on properties of the surface, um, whether it's orientable or non-orientable, um, its genus, the number of odd degree vertices in the graph, and whether or not the graph is what we call checkerboardable or not. So um, we say a graph is checkerboardable if its faces can be two colored. Um, and of course, adjacent faces, faces sharing an edge have to be colored differently. Um, so just to give you a rough idea of how this proof goes, um, you just count the number of of independent stabilizer generators, and then k is k is equal to n minus that number. Um, so then, so there's a stabilizer generator for every face. So of course we have at most that many independent generators, um, but uh, so those aren't all independent. So actually, the product of all faces is always identity, um, and you can like even use some properties of these of these cyclically anti-commuting lists list to show that every the product of everything in the list has to be identity. So if I take the product of all faces, um, I will get identity on the entire space. And then also if the if the graph happens to be checkerboardable, then the product of all of one color of the faces, uh, let's say the product of all the white faces, is also identity. So um, you get these two different um, dependencies. Okay, so this reduces the number of independent generators, as, as I've written here. And uh, this is basically how the proof goes. You have to apply Euler's formula, and that's how you get the genus part. Um, but I, I think you can get the idea. Okay, so let's see some examples of this formula in action. Um, if the So on the, on the left-hand side, this is the rotated surface code. Um, and I would say this graph is not checkerboardable, and this is a bit of a surprise because, you know, look, I've drawn this and it looks like a checkerboard. <laughs> um, but there's actually an outer face. This is, a, this is a tiling of the sphere. There's an outer face around this graph, and the outer face borders both white faces and black faces. Um, so it's impossible to color the outer face consistently. Um, so in, in this sense, this graph is not checkerboardable. It also has four odd degree vertices. Um, that you can count, those are just the corners, they're degree three, everything else is degree four. Um, so if you plug this into the formula, it's a, you know, it's a genus zero surface, it has four odd degree vertices, uh, we get the total number of, of encoded qubits is one. Um, compare this to the, to the right-hand side, this is a, a checkerboardable graph, it's on the torus, um, and so, so genus equals one, it's orientable, um, it's checkerboardable, which means we have two encoded qubits. Um, now you may notice that, yeah, you may notice something a little bit funny here. So if I, uh, this graph is only checkerboardable because I've chosen it to be like four by four. So there are four horizontal lines and there are four vertical lines. If instead I choose it to be three by three, then the graph is no longer checkerboardable. Um, and so, so here's like an attempt to checkerboard it. So I, I, I've colored these two faces black and I've colored their neighbors white, but then I don't know what to do with the, the faces around the, the outside. Um, so this ends up being not checkerboardable. And if you plug this into the formula, you see that the number of encoded qubits is now one. So we've actually lost an encoded qubit. Um, it's a very similar graph. It just happens that you know when there's an odd dimension of your square lattice on the on the torus, then you lose one of the encoded qubits because it it's it, it's no longer checkerboardable. Um, despite this, sometimes I will um, draw the graph and color it, um, uh, even though it's not checkerboardable. I will color it such so there are faces, uh, neighboring faces that are the same color. Um, and in doing so, I will define these defect lines, which is, uh, which basically um, include the edges where, uh, the edges between faces of the same color. Um, so if you removed these edges from the graph, then you would get a checkerboardable graph. Um, that is how the defect line goes. Um, 
this won't be a big deal in this talk. Um, but I'm just saying that this is some way that you can define a generalized notion of checkerboard ability um, that makes these you know, defect lines between twists, um, uh, it gives them a mathematical definition. Okay, so uh, let's get into some examples. Uh, so the first example I want to go through are what we're calling cyclic torque codes. Um, so uh, the way to draw these is on the torus, you draw two lines, two perpendicular lines, y equals bx over a and y equals minus ax over b. Um, and then, you know, this is how you draw the graph, wherever the... And if we draw the cyclically anti-commuting lists around every vertex, um, then you can see explicitly these stabilizers x, z, zx, uh, the famous five qubits code stabilizers, and the code is cyclic um, because you can you can uh, uh, translate these square faces um, along along the the y equals b over a x direction. Um, more generally, um, you get some you get codes with um, a squared plus b squared physical qubits. Um, if if n the number of physical qubits is odd, um, then you have one encoded qubit and the distance is a plus b. If n is even, you get two physical qubits and the distance is is the maximum of a and b. Um, so actually, we achieve n equals kd squared over two in two different regimes. So when uh, when you choose a equals b minus one or when you choose a equals 1 and b to be odd. And this is interesting because you know the rotated surface code um, achieves n equals kd squared, and here we've, we've had that, right? Um, so I, sh I should point out that the a equals b minus 1 codes appear in this, in this paper by Kovalev, Dumer, and Priyadko, uh, where they're described somewhat differently. All right, so some of you might be wondering, you know, you've defined your, your surface code model. Um, how does that relate to Kataev's surface code? So in, in Kataev's model, you start with an embedded graph, uh, just as we do, but you place qubits on the edges, and you define x-type and z-type stabilizers around vertices and faces, respectively. Um, in our model, how we would describe this is we would say there's a surface code defined on the medial graph. Of, of the graph that you started with. So you start with some graph here, and I'm showing this on the projective plane because, well, in the end, we're gonna end up with uh, Shor's code. <laughs> um, so uh, we start with some graph, we associate qubits to the, to the edges. Um, and then in our model, how we would define the, the stabilizers, they have to be associated to faces. So we should make every vertex and every face in this in this graph into um, a face in this medial graph. Um, and so um, something we should point out about the medial graph is that they are always checkerboardable and they are also always uh, four regular. Um, so you so if you have a Kataev surface code um, you always end up with an with in our model what we would call um, checkerboardable and four regular graphs. Um, now that means you also don't have any odd degree vertices, so m equals zero. Um, so so uh, in our theorem for the number of encoded qubits, you would you would simply have you know two times g encoded qubits or um, or g depending on whether the surface is orientable or not. And now, now similar observations about um, medial graphs were made uh, in, in these two papers. OK, but uh, moving on with some more examples, um, we can take these stellated codes, of which the, the triangle code is, is one example, and place them on higher genus surfaces. Um, so the, the key observation here is that uh, if I take a a square and associate its opposite sides. You know that represents a torus, of course. Um, but likewise, if you take a hexagon and and 
associate the, the opposite sides, that also represents a torus. Um, so if we look over on the, on the right-hand side at the triangular surface code, um, and um, we now associate opposite edges, you know, we, we imagine this triangular surface code um, as a hexagon, and we associate opposite edges, um, then we've embedded this onto a torus. Um, and actually, when you do this, you double the number of logical qubits, and you slightly reduce the number of physical qubits as well, because now um, some qubits that were on the edges of the original code are associated would associated with the qubit on the opposite edge. Um, so you uh, you subtract the number of physical qubits uh, related to the perimeter of the code, um, and you can do this for for these higher order stellated codes as well. Um, just in general, if you have an n-gon and you associate opposite sides, uh, you represent a, a genus n over 4 um, surface. And so, so here, for instance, is the stellated code with uh, like five-fold symmetry. It starts out as a 32-2-5 code, um, but then you can, um, by embedding on the double torus, um, get a 23-4-5 code. So in general, we're like doubling the number number of logical qubits, and so actually, with with higher symmetry and higher genus surfaces, um, you approach n equals one quarter kd squared, um, versus you know n equals one half kd squared, uh, which is the the planar stellated codes in Kessel ring. Okay, so, but what if we don't want to go to higher genus surfaces? Um, and we also don't want to have a have this sort of hyperbolic geometry in the center where we have to pack a lot of qubits into a small area. Um, well, then we could look at just just codes in the plane. Um, so in this case, we think about this problem as a circle packing problem. We want to take these twist defects um, and uh, pack them as as closely as we can in the plane, but still allowing a distance d between them, where d is the code distance. So the triangle code, of course, drawn here, achieves 3 quarters kd squared, and we'll abstract away the, the lattice work. Um, so the lattice work basically controls the distance. You can choose whatever distance you want by choosing a finer and finer lattice. But here's sort of the abstract triangle code. If we extend the patch a bit and add two more odd degree vertices um, represented by the stars, then um, we also add two more of these d over 2 by d over 2 square faces. Um, but in, in total, we get a smaller constant. So we get n equals 5 eighths kd squared. And likewise, we can, we can just keep uh, extending this this code patch and get closer and closer uh, to one half kd squared, um, and uh, uh, one this one half kd squared was also pointed out um, by Hastings and Geller, and this is a this is like a concrete patchwork implementation of of that um, uh, of that uh, density. Okay, so the, the second to last thing that I want to talk about is how you come up with bounds on the code distance. So um, to do this, we define a decoding graph for our graph, and this associates a vertex to every face, and then um, edges correspond to vertices in the original graph. There's an edge between two faces. If there exists a poly at that vertex, um, that anti-commutes with exactly two faces. And there can be multiple edges per, per vertex. Um, so in, for instance, around a degree three vertex, um, you kind of, you have this three click, a triangle. Around a degree four, four vertex, you just have this, this cross, an X. And around degree five, you have like a, a five click. Around degree six, you have two uncoupled uh, degree, uh, three clicks, um, et cetera. Um, and so it also turns out that any poly at, on the qubits at that vertex can re, re, be represented by taking some subset of the edges. 
and multiplying the polys that those edges represent together. Um, because of what we pointed out previously, that you can sort of decompose higher degree vertices into degree three or four vertices using these cyclically anti-commuting list constructions, um, we'll only consider graphs with degree three or four for the um, for the following slide. Um, right. So here's an example of the decoding graph. Here's some here's some like service code patch. Um, I didn't draw the defect lines, but you can see that um, you can see it's not exactly checkerboardable. It's only checkerboardable with some defects, as as mentioned earlier. Um, there are four odd degree vertices marked by the stars. Um, so cycles in the decoding graph represent stabilizers and logical operators of the code. Um, and these cycles are allowed to go through the outer face as well, uh, whose vertex is not drawn. But um, So stabilizers, for instance, are, are these A, B, and C, or represent stabilizers, cycles in the decoding graph that represent stabilizers, logical X, um, I mean, we're arbitrarily calling it X, but logical X um, is represented by the cycles D and E in the decoding graph. And then logical Z is represented by cycle uh, F in the decoding graph. Okay, so here's an efficient algorithm to get a, some bounds on the distance, or in some cases it actually gives you uh, the exact distance. So given a graph G, create its decoding graph, and then find a minimum cycle basis of the decoding graph. A minimum cycle basis is, uh, well, a set of cycles um, that forms a basis for the entire cycle space, um, such that the, the total length of the cycles is minimized. And uh, this can be done with um, Horton's algorithm. Uh, he was the first to come up with an efficient polynomial time algorithm. Um, but there are also more efficient alternatives out there. And then um, third, you convert each of these cycles that you found in the in the minimum cycle basis to a poly um, using the correspondence of decoding graph to decoding graph cycles to polys or edges in the decoding graph to polys. And um, you can also figure out which of these these cycles are non-trivial by seeing if the poly anti-commutes with some other poly from the cycle basis. And those are going to be your non-trivial logical operators. Um, that is, those are not stabilizers. Um, and let w be the, the length of the shortest non-trivial cycle or non-trivial logical operator. Then the theorem says that if the graph is checkerboardable, the distance is exactly this weight uh, or this length w. If the graph is not checkerboardable, um, then w over 2 is a lower bound on the distance and w is an upper bound. OK, um, finally, I want to point out that um, there's like a generalized form of Pachner move. Again, we can just think about degree 3 and 4. And then what we really want to do is be able to move around the odd degree vertices, these degree 3 vertices. Um, because if we can move those around, then we could like swap them. And this corresponds to, this, to swapping uh, poly logical operators. Uh, that is, we've done a logical Clifford. Um, so if we can move these odd degree vertices around, then we can do some logical Cliffords. Um, so here, for instance, we have a degree, a degree 4 and a degree 3 vertex. And if we want to swap those degrees, we can do a control Z gate on the two qubits here. Um, Right, so, so the, the upshot is that a local transformation um, can take one code to another, um, another code that's, that's only distinct locally. Right, so we've reached the end of the talk. Um, so our paper will be out shortly, within a few weeks, we hope, and that'll have more information about what I talked, uh, talked about here. Um, yeah, so, so thank you for, for listening to this talk. Um, if you have any questions uh, in the meantime or even after the paper comes out, um, you can feel free to reach me at, at this email address. Thank you.